Con well, if I were to give you any hints at all, Jolly, it would be a overall X's on the map of where AoE died. So we can go ahead and find out about that, as it was uh, answer being all over, unfortunately. So let's go ahead and try to break that down here right off the bat, because I know we have some thoughts. RMC, I'll start off with you this time, because you seem to have the most tame opinion. <laughs> Out of all that. Uh <laughs> Well, we we, all, we had some discussion over the draft here, Colomer and myself, about uh, how we thought these drafts functioned. And personally, uh, I I think I'm fine with AOE randoms draft for the most part. I fully agree with what Rebel and Jolly were saying there. Yeah, the, the Volbear, Kalissa, Amumu, I think, was meant to be that engine, that driving force in the early game. You get that lead, you drive it, and then you scale up with the Kassan and Jax to close things out. It didn't work out. Cycle and Pock is given that early double kill, just messed everything up at that point. Because now your bot lane isn't winning. Uh, Rose Thorn gets to go wherever he wants. Draco, by the way, great job in the 1v1 against Geiger. Tw was that 20 CS up in lane, even before the, the gank into that top side here? And once you've got that many losing lanes for randoms, you don't have a lane to play through anymore. And then you're trying to outscale a team which was built to scale. And that's when things start to fall apart a little. Okay. Yep. Should I just take it, or you want to go revision? No, no. You know what, <laughs> Oliver? It's I was gonna lead you into it, but I know you're smart enough, man, to just you know what? Lay to it just full send it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I don't want to hit on draft because personally, I really don't like either of these drafts. <laughs> uh, I I really don't like drafting triple AP top side into champions that can itemize uh, early merc treads very easily. Uh, I don't like. I understand that you see you triple AP top side and you're like, bro, Cassidy. Uh, the issue that I have with this Kassadin and pick is that the entire rest of your team is literally useless after like 12 minutes. Uh, so you want, you need to be able to get ahead. Like, this is not a game where like, oh yeah, bro, like, uh, the, these three champions are going to carry us through the early game. And then later Kassadin will come online because by the time Kassadin comes online, the rest of your team is worthless, dude. Like, Vola Bear gets outscaled by like level six. And like you were talking about RMC. Uh, you know, once this early bot play happens where they lose the 2v2, uh, your Kalissa Mumu lane is basically shot. Because again, you're against a lane with Zai that actually can do damage early and can beat you in early trades with uh, with the goal that you gave over. Um, and the Jax losing the Gwen, uh, you know, as the counter pick. And honestly, I was talking about how Draco needs to sh uh, step up and showcase like how good he is because I really do think that this guy uh, mechanically is insane. Like wi winning a losing matchup that hard when you blind pick this Gwen that... Uh, you know, before the game, other than him and Kaiser Mord, basically no one is even still playing this champion. Uh, I think says a lot to his skill and his ability mm -hmm. to basically sway this game. And then Random's in the situation where, okay, our counterpick top lane is losing. Our mid lane Kassin is very hard to gain for. Uh, and honestly, it's like going even into the side list. And then our bot lane is losing. Also, we get outscaled by 13 minutes. Also, we lost the first three dragons. Also, we're getting caught out because I think Amuba got caught out a couple times. So uh, it was just really unplayable for Randoms. I really don't want to see them go for a composition that is so reliant on getting ahead early i think clg's biggest weakness is that they have been they've you know kind of self-erupted in some ways where they kind of beat mm -hmm. themselves and i think you know as we get into a replay where basically the entire game gets swung um let clg make mistakes you don't have to opt in these situations where you know at this point in the game you're down three dragons you have to fight this for soul point but you're already so far behind with this composition that you put yourself on a timer uh, that, you know, as soon as COG wins this fight, it's game over. I really want to see randoms give themselves a bit more flexibility and not have the game be decided by like 10 minutes. Okay, Calmer. You know, the, the thing is, a lot of that was predicated on the fact that randoms fell behind. If, I think if it went to plan, they would have been fine in the mid game. They would have a big enough lead. But I fully agree with you. This was a risk they didn't have to take. And it's a best of three. So game one, you can afford to take this sort of risk for randoms. I appreciate it. I do think that ideally you want to take control of the game. But going into game two, when your backs are already up against the wall, and keep in mind, you know, Calmer laid it all out to start the day. If randoms lose here, they lose their chance for proving grounds as well. Yeah, then go and pick a more safe composition, something that scales up, that doesn't force you to make no mistake. Give, you, give yourself some margin of error here and... Going into game two, I agree. I'd like to see that sort of thing. Maybe not the Kalista move in the bot lane and definitely not Volibear. I feel like there's so many other picks that can do similar things to Volibear with so much more safety where, you know, you're not just the first three levels, get that early gank or fall off and do nothing. I can speak to this a little bit from like coming from like a coaching background and being around the space so long uh, on like a team side. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, when you're in these situations where it's ba you know it is the last game of your season, backs against the wall, uh, teams are going to default towards getting a scaling advantage because you want to have something in your back pocket uh, and the most comfortable uh, comfortable champions that you can have. So, uh, Udir obviously is going to be very high prio. I don't think uh, that's any surprise, especially after the first game. Um, but I expect that to be basically gone within the first two picks on either side. Uh, I expect Psycho to get a more scaling AD carry. Uh, maybe like a Zeri or a Jinx or something like that. Champions that he's shown that he can play decently Jin. well. It, yeah, I, I still think that Jin doesn't really fit like what they want to do though. Because again, like uh, I, I'm, I'm imagining a hyper carry in, like my, in all my wisdom. I'm imagining a hyper carry uh, and, you know, some more comfort champions in the scaling event. Um, you know, maybe Orn, you know, top lane can play anything. Put him on Orn. Orn duty. Yeah. I love Orn. Orn is so good. But yeah, drop the Volibear, Bear, drop uh, the Moomba support maybe. And uh, that's the changes I hope to see. And I think that they will make going into this next game. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> right back and forth. And you know what? Just go ahead and address that. And just to wrap it up in a nice little boat. The draft at a certain point in time right now needs to be for safety. There needs to be clear indications of what you need to do going right from the early game. So that way, you're not putting yourself in an unfortunately executable need to get done timer where it leads you down a rabbit hole. Because CLG, as you know, will go full W key in and decide that it's time to fight right from minute one if they see the opportunity. So just to make sure that doesn't happen, you know, yeah, both AOE and both CLG need to play just a little bit smarter. You know, let's go ahead and hold things back. Maybe not just go right into the bushes and decide whether or not what we want to see happen in case anybody's hiding there. And currently, so far CLG is winning the war of attrition and even more so it seems as though there's not much strangling left hanging at the end. And what a with it, what a with what a beautiful monologue! I am so impressed. <laughs> you considered ever being an analyst instead of a host review? Jesus, man, that was great. <laughs> All right, Calmer, thank you again for your input. Really, really do appreciate it. You know, guys, just guy from Twitter, Calmer, by the way. But with that being said, <laughs> we do have game number two right up front. So I hope you're all ready. I know we're not ready, but I hope the casters are. Jolly, Rebel Fox, you ready? Somebody get me out of here. Look at me paying attention to make sure that I don't miss the throw. <laughs> I can imagine that there are some really good points broken down there that I did not um, have the liberty of being able to hear on my end. Again, technical difficulties we're still working through. But, but what would you say, Rebel Fox? And again, I don't really know exactly what they talked about there on the desk. But what would you say needs to change here? Because the sides are going to be the same for AOE randoms to be able to push this out to a game number three. Uh, I want to see more activity. Um, I, I don't think they fully use the Callista Mumu combination. And even if they redraft it, I want to see it again. Like, like just use it more. That's my number mm -hmm. one. Number two, I, I don't mind the idea of what Tassadin was supposed to do in the composition. But Nemesis 9 didn't make it happen because the team fighting never really came about. He wasn't able to become that like massive assassin that they wanted to make sure the damage threats were pushed out of fights. Mm -hmm. And also, he didn't really have a big impact. And that's been the player that's been stepping up biggest for AoE random. So I want to see more agency for Nemesis, and then I want to see them just take more fights. Like, I think those two things alone with basically the same composition would be more than enough for that game alone to be more competitive, let alone one mm -hmm. where they don't fall behind in gold. Yeah, I definitely agree. And, and you know, maybe, maybe making moves on recognizing when, uh, you know, there's a, a really struggling lane. Like, towards the top side, uh, or in the early parts of this game, right, you had Draco kind of bullying this, this uh, Geiger on Jax, relatively early on and a lot of that had to do with rose thorn showing up of course several times right there so maybe getting a little bit of earlier response to try to boost a little bit of geiger to potentially be able to use the counter pick ability because they are going to be selecting like i said red side once again in this game meaning they have many opportunities for counter picks now, i do wonder if the udir gets taken off the board here for the side of AOE randoms i think in the last game that they had anticipated that udir would be let through and that rose thorn might take Volley bear um which was like a mm -hmm. it was a rose thorn champion when he was in academy but uh, of course udir was as well and udir is stronger at the moment at least in, in retrospect i think a lot of people consider that to be the case and rose thorn obviously agrees because they took it at b1 so now it's a question of do they give Volley bear and get something for cold throw that is a little bit more selective or are they cool uh, kind of handshaking that matchup once again and saying okay Okay, if you want Udir, we'll take Voldy Bear. We'll see how that one goes. Yeah, maybe <clears throat> trying to get uh, CLG, get themselves a little bit more pressure in the early parts of the game by going with uh, a different lane even. You know, you have the Zeri that was banned away 
There we go. That's going to be the secondary uh -huh. one. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it was still the Seraphine that they have locked in, but it would really surprise me. Yeah, to let that Udyr go through right now, it's really not worth it. And, and it's so difficult to use that counter pick ability that we've seen so often with the Lilia when you have so much raw damage and follow up crowd control and initiation coming from CLG. The Fiora is going to be the same. Viego was the final ban that AoE randoms locked in in the last phase, or at least in game number one. So it is very likely that they're going to try to do some sort of run back and maybe just implement a bit more aggression into uh, their play style instead of adjusting the composition. I'm going to jump into a player really quick because I think it's important to note this. When this team got announced, to me, there was like, at least when I was looking at this roster, there was one thing that kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, and that was Draco. Because I was a little familiar with Town, not very familiar, but it was obviously somebody they were pulling out. But Draco mm -hmm. had come from like 2018, 2019 Proving Grounds, hadn't played very yep. much, didn't know very much. I was like, this is a very weird selection for this team. And it's gotten to the point where I'm very happy about Draco. I think Draco has turned into the top laner that they would like him to be. I find it hilarious the fact that he pulls just about 100 bans, and that's like the, the meme around Draco is that they've banned him like nine times during the course of a series. So it's similar mm. to like Sketch when he pulled 10 bans during one series or something along those lines. Um, and in this game, they give him the Gwen once again, which I think is a little bit of a mistake. But obviously in the last <laughs> game showed very heavily the, the ability to, to use that champion to its fullest, and I don't expect anything less in game. Yeah, and now it's the opportunity here for AoE randoms to say, okay, well, we didn't get the uh, the jungle pick to come through because it was a Viego ban, like I said last time, which is another Rose Thorn special. We haven't seen it as much as of late, but very, very powerful. And it's the Udyr that they ended up swapping that for, like we were kind of anticipating here, Rebel Fox. But again, potentially locking in your assumption of maybe some sort of run back. I don't necessarily know if a Mumu was the way to go with how much, again, how much damage CLG Faith tends to draft on their side. So they're gonna angle things a little bit different and lock in another nemesis favorite here in the Azir. Okay, I'm cool with running back the, the composition now. Uh, to me, this was the one thing that it needed. It was like consistent range damage dealer and mm -hmm. AP threat, that type of thing. Kassadin, I love him. He's one of my favorite champions in the game. Didn't fit perfectly because, again, he's melee. He's, his intention is to try to remove somebody on the back line. You can't unstick him from a composition. It's a really great decision. Here, that's definitely going to be the case, or it's not going to be the case now that Nemesis 9 has the ability to fight forward uh, into everybody else. So if they wanted to run back exactly the Amumu, you know, the, you know, the Holy Bear, that type of thing, I don't think that would necessarily be even the wrong choice because I think it's a lot easier for his ear to make impact in a game like this. Yeah, that's, I, that's a really good point. And the range alone, right, because you got this kind of you know, you got this sneaky play style that you can do really with both of these champions, but with Car or with uh, Kassadin, if you end up getting locked down, like we saw happen so many times with the crowd control that was available, especially thanks to Silas being able to use, you know, the Amumu ultimate, the Ball of Bear ultimate, things like that, where you're able to really just jump in on somebody like Kassadin, doesn't give you many opportunities. And there we go. We saw the Blitzcrank hover before, but now we are actually getting the lock into that bottom lane is going to be Callista Blitz, who uh, is also very fun to throw in with that ulti. Yeah, similar forcing power to the Amumu. Obviously, it's not the same as being able to throw Amumu in and then pop the ultimate, and it's his big AoE stun. Instead, it's just the AoE silence with some damage behind it. But the bigger thing is that Ash is incredibly immobile, and also, uh, you know, Renata is incredibly immobile. There's nothing that either of those two can do to speed themselves up unless they buy, like, a Shirelia's or something along mm -hmm. those lines. They have to slow down the opposition. And so Pacus, who has had this champion ready to go, he played it, I believe, uh, when when they were back on, like, a wild card, wild card amateur, those type of, uh, you know, teams. Um, I pulled it out a couple of times and does well with it. It's more of a pocket pick, I think, to Pogus than to most mm -hmm. other supports who aren't willing to pull it out in similar situations. This is specifically to punish the bottom lane, and I like that because I think you know, Aaron and Trevor got away with quite a bit, and I don't think Pogus wants to let him get away with it again. Yeah, and add more damage on too, right? Not only do you have, you know, this ability to kind of catch out these individual members, and when you see somebody like an Ash locked in, that's a good opportunity because unlike Azaya, she doesn't have easy escape ability whatsoever. In fact, she's one of the more vulnerable ADCs in those opportunities. I like the fact that they've still got the Renata Glass locked in here, included. They're going with a different kind of style and strategy and having locked that uh that Ash in relatively early on to go into the Callista. But I do like the the it's it this these lock-ins, these two adjustments just to the Azir and the Blitzcrank literally spells out that more aggression is definitely at the top of the list of you know directives that AoE ran randoms needs to in initiate really into this game number two the final ones are going to be against town in terms of bans here for aoe randoms they respect ban away that silas it was just too darn good and they've got some pretty good ultimates here on the side of aoe randoms they don't want to allow through and then of course the victor who is another very strong one and quite good into the azir and also has that range they're looking for trundle will be the final one here for clg 
I really don't hate anything about this so far from the randoms. I, I think randoms mm -hmm. composition is looking really complete. The only thing they're missing is a tank jungler. I think that's the one thing that I would like to see out of them. But outside of that, I, they, they've got the ability to pick people. They've got a good amount of AOE damage. They have forcing power in a number of situations. They got range damage. They got great consistent damage. They're a well-rounded composition. I love what I'm seeing from the randoms here. And it's giving Nemesis a lot of agency. Uh, there's a number of really good things about everything that I'm seeing right now from them. I would love to see Vi, obviously, no. but uh, I don't know whether we'll get that one. We've seen it at support a couple of times during this tournament, but unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get that one. See, I think that makes a lot more sense. Another, another, yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, following following Colomer earlier on. I definitely suggested. I love it. He's like, hey, casters out there, when you see a hover, all right, it's not like a potential pick. It's just these players hovering their girlfriend's favorite. Okay, it's to give them a little uh, bit of a, of a smile on their faces, but I, it is going to be the Wukong. A quick peek behind the curtain also is this is sometimes yeah. our producer playing with us instead of anything else. And so it's possible that he was just toying around with the idea uh, of uh, what else might be picked in front of us. So it's him hovering for his girlfriend, what, what she would want to be, uh not just the players <laughs> themselves doing it. I am a little disappointed at Colthrow picking up the graves here and just like, I, they didn't need more damage in this composition. I, I yeah. really wish it would have just gone like, Sejuani or something like that. Like I, I understand, maybe it's not the greatest of matchups purely into the, uh, the you know the Wukong, or maybe it's not favored. Maybe you know it's not it's not the perfect pick necessarily in all situations. But I think it would have rounded this composition flawlessly to have something that can play a little bit more on the front foot, has a little bit more engage range, that type of thing that Colthrow could have abused. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Like I said, as four champions outside of the Graves, I think it's a great composition. I don't think the Graves really ruins that. Uh, they can kite backwards really effectively. I will note that rather than playing forward, they can kite backwards with the Graves. But again, that's, that's my one complaint about this. The Volibear will, was still up and available. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, Kulthra always does an amazing job on Volibear and did a really good job last game in trying to stay alive and do that front line. But this one is going to be different as we load into game number two up in the sky. We can see that CLG Faith versus AoE Randoms. It is match point right now. CLG Faith just needs to win one more game to be able to sweep this series aoe randoms they've run back a few of their champions they pick the same side and they're going in with a different game plan that hopefully can be executed a little more along their liking you know what i would have really liked in this zach i think i would have liked zach oh, a little bit. Yeah. I, like if, if for no other reason because again i'm pretty sure that wukong can knock him up in the middle of his like uh he's uh you stretch and, and launch himself maneuver. elastic slingshot remember. yeah elastic slingshot in yeah, the middle yeah. of that i think he can get knocked up by wukong in the middle of that so it's not a perfect uh -huh, pick, the cyclone but, like uh -huh. it's the perfect amount of combination of like forcing power <laughs> where you can gank in the early game you can kind of get into ash and renata and make sure that they're going to be pressured out the back of a fight and the perfect amount of you press ultimate you stand on your carries and that means gwen can't stand on them wukong can't stand on them that kind of thing I, I'm just mm -hmm. spitballing here that like there, there were champions that I think could have fit into the composition a lot better than what the Graves does, which opens up to me again this very veteran player, uh, you know, Colthrow and what he's able to do with the Graves pick because it was their last pick. It's what he decided was necessary for this composition to have. As we get a nice look at some of the, uh, <laughs> the wonderful insects across the rift here, so yeah, you know, we get to see some some fungi maybe that's kind of kind of built up along the walls. <laughs> I thought, there. thought those were butterflies. That's what they, I thought they were I looking at. I, you know what? I don't. Okay, I don't have perfect clarity that's on my fine, screen that's here, fine, so yeah. I could have be butterflies, mushrooms, same thing. I don't know. They both fly, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay. go outside. I play video games here, all right? I'm pretty sure there's a game where a mushroom flies around. <laughs> Either way, though, it is going to be a lot of pressure that CLG Faith is able to put here in the start. They do, of course, have to watch out for pockets when it comes to positioning like this. You have few opportunities where you have to stay behind these minions, or if your pockets, few opportunities where you can push forward when that second uh, row of minions is coming through. But CLG, they're not going to be that uh, they, that silly about things. They're not going to give him any sort of opportunity here. So that does allow for Colthrow and Rosethorn to spend a bit of time here in the jungles as we've got just a bit of back and forth going on. Yeah, the one benefit about having this double range lane is it does give you quite a bit more trading power. Nice pull, but level two. Ooh. It is a solid one. And it is Trevor who ends up having to flash away. The ignite was used on them. Aaron, though, still able to provide quite a bit of damage. And it's just going to end like that. Unfortunate side with Aaron here is, you know, as a level one, level two Ash, you really are not doing that much damage at all. Hots are also already burned from Zyko, which means that, uh, you know, he's going to be missing quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, in lane sustain. The Dorans and then the additional cookies also in, in favor of Aaron here means that eventually the sustain is going to be superior in a number of different ways. Rosethorn, I think, got a little glimpse at Colthrow. 
going to not be able to step into his own jungle, I suppose. So the double range bottom lane, again, if it weren't for that pull and it weren't for all the trade damage that went down, I think they might have been able to step into jungle and assist here, as this is the second time in a row that we've seen Rose Thorn kind of poke around to see if he can walk into this top side with the support of his bottom lane. But it doesn't end mm -hmm. up uh, you know, panning out properly. Instead, he's just going to take what he can get. He's going to double scuttle again, it looks like. It's going to take him a little longer to get there because he's going to stop for Raptors. But I don't know if Cold Throw is going to be able to get there ahead of time for him. It's a nemesis, though, in push. So if you wanted to beeline it there, I think he absolutely could just to prevent that from going through. Yeah, there's the ping. There's the ping coming out. So he yeah. is going to uh, manage to snake down to that scuttle, Rose Thorn just taking the opportunity to get as much creep as possible. And yeah, the expectation is that Coulthor is going to be a little bit behind just due to uh, the, his, his reload ability, his passive here in this game. But it also gives him the chance to uh, get some really, Ooh. really early invades. And here is Ooh. potentially going to be one of them. As I say it, it potentially comes to fruition. It's as though I have watched these players play this <laughs> game before. I actually really <laughs> like what I just saw from Rose Thorn because Rose Thorn has done a creative pathing. He, he didn't do Krugs. He didn't do Raptors until a little bit ago. I think he wanted to, like, he, he took the scuttle and he had the option to cross into topside to go for a double scuttle. Um, which, like, Talon wasn't able to support at all. The two of them have been trading heavily in terms of mana and health. So instead, just goes to his Raptors, turns back to potentially Krux, and sees an opportunity to gank to bottom lane. And it does force the Flash out of pockets, which is an important little tool to... Because, again, that that's playmaking that you could potentially use. He does have mm -hmm. a Hex Flash, but at least it's something uh, that they are able to get for Rose Thorn freely, just kind of walking into bottom side off the back of that uh, little, little wraparound he used. Mm-hmm. Already, though, I'm excited to see the Geigers having a much better game. I don't know if you remember how much Geiger struggled in the early parts of game number one, and it was while having a counter pick, a pretty early skirmish between the two members where it was really just, it ended up being a one for zero in favor of Draco previously, but Geiger does have that chance now playing as this game plank, and it also offers some more of that, you know, the, that range, that distance we were looking for. You've got the global ultimate that he's going to have available here as he is still, or he is level five. <laughs> Um, teleport still up and available if he decides he wants to use that on the pushback, but he's got a lot of pressure in this lane, so he can really kind of make up his mind on how he wants to move forward. As we look at the experience, we can see Town and Geiger, the two that are fighting across the board for that. No surprise that Cold Throw is the one six. that is a little bit stacked at the moment. But really, this is the expectation for a game like this, especially when it comes to AoE randoms, knowing that this is game number two, their backs are against the wall, it's match point for CLG Faith, they're going to be as slow as possible. And with the composition that they have organized here, it's actually forcing CLG Faith to play a lot slower than they would like to in the first five to ten minutes of the game. Yes. I want to see Rose Thorn get active. You have gank set up in, in multiple places. Trevor also hasn't been able to move because, again, the Blitzcrank is a lot more threatening to the Ash than the previous game where it was the Amumu. It's a little harder to make things happen. I think Pacus is a lot more dangerous on the Blitzcrank than the Amumu specifically, uh, you know, out, you know, negating how valuable it is to throw alongside the Callista. It's made mm -hmm. Trevor kind of stick around bottom lane a little more than you'd normally expect to see uh, because, again, he usually spends zero time down here. Now he has to spend any amount of time down here, and that's uh, just outside of the realm of Trevor. Uh, and that means that, again, it's up to Rose Thorn, I think, to have the real map influence that you would normally be looking for from, uh, you know, potentially Trevor or the combination of the two that he's going to have to match. I mean, you've got a charm, you've got Gwen in the top lane that you'd like to set up, you've got plenty of places to go. Mm, speaking of places to go, Nemesis mm -hmm. going to have to go back a little bit. <laughs> At least just pressure away. And it was perfect timing right there for Nemesis to realize, hey, I don't have vision. I don't know exactly where Rose Thorn is. I have to back away from this one. And in the meantime, we can see I was talking about how Geiger has the opportunity to make the decision. Do I want to walk back to lane or do I want to teleport? And he did choose to make that long walk. He is level six now. So you've got the cannon barrage. He's got a TP. And there's the opportunity for AOE randoms to make a big play if they really want to around the next dragon that pops up because CLG Faith really didn't give him a chance but after picking up that burst. I think one of the biggest things that it does effectively is that there's no pressure that can be applied to top lane that I think guarantees you Rift Herald, right? Or there's no real shift, I think, necessarily that they can make mm -hmm. into that play. It has to come from other some other avenue. Here, it's like the massive push that Draco's got against Geiger, uh, which he could catch very easily. He's not going to lose any of the farm. It's, it's a really, really big wave that he's able to snag up. It does open up a little bit for Rift Herald, potentially. You can see Cole throws poking around that area, though, as he's going to run headfirst into Draco. <laughs> Neither one of them really want that smoke at all. As once again, it's just ships passing in the night. Nothing for Rose Thorn here either. I'm really surprised we haven't seen Rose Thorn make an attempt somewhat, right? You've got Charm, you've got you know, Ash Arrow, you've got all of Renata's kit, basically. You've got so many good options to help kind of compound with a Wukong to make really impressive plays. And yet we haven't really seen much. Instead, 
Uh, they they do know they had control. The push in top led back to uh, you know a median wave. You saw that mid lane, uh, you know both mid laners ended up leaving, and it's actually a step up from Trevor to make sure that that's going to be uh, you know caught up in, in the middle of places. And it opens up I think for Rose Thorn to grab up the Rift Herald before anything else with very mild punishment. Bottom wave is going to get dropped. I think it's probably two three minions maximum that get lost by Aaron right here. Uh, if it's even going to be that, it's two, I think, uh, above all other things. And then a back coming through from Psycho and Pocus as they're not able to respond to Rift Herald. Yeah, Colthrow doing a really good job, too. Finding that pretty early in Vade, right? Uh, seeing, okay, Rosethorn did that kind of funky pathing uh, towards the bottom lane in the early parts of the game, and that meant that that was the Gromp that was able to be picked up, you know? That meant that uh, just, just a lot of vision was able to be placed down, and so AoE Random's able to make some of these moves and, again, stay safe for themselves and say, hey, all right, we have at least some eyes on Rosethorn. We need to keep that communication up because we can continue the pressure, and the later this game goes on, the better things are looking for AoE randoms. You have a bit more fall off coming from the side of CLG Faith and so many initiation opportunities out of AoE randoms when they decide to group up as a team. Once again, now we haven't seen any kill participation. Maybe we're almost 10 minutes into the game and haven't even seen a kill yet uh, you know, from either team, which is uh, usually something that we see. It's usually a bit more of a spectacle than this inside of North American Amateur. Maybe Geiger and Draco want to want to show us how it's done. <laughs> Draco's taking quite a bit of damage wow. here, but there is the needlework. He's going to get the one off. No, that was the final one, actually. So oh, not able to follow up with more than that. But there it is. Out comes Cold Throw. Should be able to pick up Trevor. And it actually goes over to Psycho as he holds off on that. Rose Thorn is in the wings. Geiger throwing out his ultimate to guarantee that kill. Oh, oh, and it's still just back and forth up here on the top side. They're just waiting for the first jungle to decide to make an appearance. Goodness gracious. Yeah, Geiger has been challenging Rose Thorn to come up the top lane just as much as he's wanted to because he's just been shoved underneath this tower. Draco has been shoved underneath this tower the majority of the game. It's not even a farm advantage really from Geiger. He's just constantly shoving these waves in as much as possible. He goes under tower. Oh my he gosh, Geiger, is he going to be able to get out of life? Well, the minions, minions deal the minions, damage, minions, that minions. should do it. <laughs> <laughs> he can't run away from those. And he had just used the remove scurry to stay alive, but he still managed to pick up that first kill before going down. Remarkably closer. Remarkably closer than I thought it was going to be, because I thought the second tower shot was actually going to kill him right here. And it was stepping up. It was just like the, the barrel chain. Draco thought he would be able to slip out of it with the E. Uh, Draco mm -hmm. was underneath the tower, used the W, wasn't quite enough. That that bone plating almost actually made that big of a difference between the two. It was just the minions. It feels so bad, too. Yeah. Casters. Oh. oh, it was the casters because he uh, was able to break vision away from those frontline minions and from the cannon minion, but the casters had already sent their shots out. <laughs> and again, yep, you, there's nothing you can do about that one, unfortunately, unless you can make yourself go into stasis somehow. That is a fully completed item now, though, as we can see here in the jungle for Cold Throw, who has, has already secured his eclipse. We've also mm -hmm. got, uh, you know, a lot of that sustainability because you've got things like the Immortal Shield, though, like the eclipse that are going to be picked up for the side of AoE Rand. Them, so they have that life steal or that vamp accessible in their kits to stay alive um, because their front line is not insanely strong. However, the same can be said about CLG Faith. You were talking about how you kind of wanted more of like a tanky jungle, somebody who could go on the front line who could absorb all of this damage. Well, AoE man randoms might not necessarily have that, but neither does CLG. So it puts them in a good position. And as I say that, Geiger ends up running directly into those two members. The Cyclone goes off. Draco uses the needlework once more, and it's an easy pickup to even up the kills for CLG Faith. And should be first tower. Geiger, it's unlikely he TPs here unless he also gets Nemesis to TP here because there's two members. They probably can just dive. I, I guess Rosethorn doesn't necessarily have TP, so maybe it's not the greatest of dives, but they will pull every single plate off this tower, get first plate. Oh! Hold on. I thought that was big. I thought it was big. I thought Psycho <laughs> was going to die. That's not the case. The cleanse was used perfectly. Well yep. done, Psycho. I, I was really worried. <laughs> they chained the CC incredibly mm -hmm. well. They pulled them almost directly underneath their, their bottom tower, and it just didn't matter. Yeah, Cleanse and Flash were both expended, though. So that's mm -hmm. no Flash is available for the bottom lane. And as we can see, Aaron and Trevor still have both of theirs up and available. Now, the ultimates on the other side are still there. It's going to be the Flash away from Trevor. He does end up using that. The Ignite comes out from Pockets, who's just going to be able to do W and zoom away from this one. 
Yeah, Ooh. easy enough. It, it, it's trades back and forth between the two lanes. I actually can really appreciate that Aaron and Trevor play the use of the double ultimates underneath the tower, or my apologies, the use of the ultimate of the Ash. Mm -hmm. I, I, they did use both. Okay, they used both ultimates just a second ago to punish Psycho to prevent them from taking additional plates. They had more than enough pressure in other places to try to maybe take three or four plates to match mm -hmm. the top lane play, but they denied them probably at least one from just that uh, I, little expenditure of the CC on the bottom side. I, I do think, though, that both of those ultimates were used before before that fight even took place when Aaron and Trevor were looking for the kill onto Psycho. That, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They, okay. they used it onto Psycho to prevent them because they oh, were yeah, taking yeah. tower plates on the bottom side at the time. Yep. Um, and that would have been the response to the top side play because obviously the kill had already happened to Geiger. Yes. So I think that was the intention. So if that yeah, was yeah, their yeah. intention, see, see. yeah, very, very smart. <laughs> Making sure that they can't match the gold they actually just got got because now Draco is oh, a lot stronger gosh. than Geiger. That's not yeah, good. but Geiger has Cold Throw here in the wings. Is it going to be enough damage? There is no. the ultimate as well coming through from Geiger no. right before he ends up going down, but it doesn't matter. Ah. Thorn is in the wings. The ultimate to come out from Cold Throw. Draco is so dang fast, though. He should be able to catch up and maybe pop off that Q. He's not. Can he, can he get it? Can, oh can Cold Throw get to his allies in time? Just barely. And that is another reason you always go Eclipse and you always run through the jungle. Not just that, yeah, always running through the jungle, also smiting to get some additional health. Yep. The one fleet yep. footwork proc in the midst of everything was really yep. impressive. Uh, but ultimately, again, it's a second game in a row where it feels like AoE randoms have uh, you know, been aggressed against through topside. Geiger has felt a good amount of the early pressure uh, in two games in a row now that Draco has been able to pop off on this Gwen. And it's one of these conditions that I think they can work on for CLG Faith to really take over the game, right? Draco can start to be this massive team fight for the team in the right circumstances if there's like too aggressive of a move, right? If Psycho and Pacus uh, and even Colthrow walk too far forward and start to take a bunch of the Gwen damage, then the fight afterwards is going to look sloppy because, again, no one's here to really soak that damage. So I like that they're playing into this uh, you know, win con of Draco over the course of this whole series, but in this game especially because their bottom lane isn't quite winning as hard as it was. Mid lane's not really doing uh, you know, you know, anything. It's back to be another silent kind of farm fest between the two well that's the unfortunate side with this is uh we saw how well draco can do even into a counter pick uh and even without the, all that roam coming out of trevor right and i think a lot of it too has to do with just this aggressive play whether or not you think you're gonna win there is the mind game involved with playing incredibly aggressively right going in on an enemy that could potentially win in that 1v1 but if you make the first move you might scare him off just long enough to throw in one or two autos, one or two abilities, and that oh. allows you to have that huge upper hand. So I do think CLG Faith is doing a really good job of kind of tweaking that mental game in their favor and trying to sh essentially scare AoE randoms away from fighting potential battles that work for them. But that's going to be a huge pull. It comes through, followed up by not just the hostile takeover, the Cyclone on the backside as well. Finally, Trevor ends up going down after a long fight. The Enchanted Crystal Arrow does come through, though, and it's going to be Psycho who falls to Draco. Now Pocket is on the run town with the dash forward pocket should be able to hit this blast cone get over the wall and potentially get out of dodge but he's not necessarily in a good position because he's still on this blue side of the map and directly into the enemy tower is he where die. he goes he will die who does he fall to it ends up being a kill for town not a great circumstance. Once again, I think it's Pacus who actually came up with a great counterpick to the Renata in this Blitzcrank, because again, when you pull, you also can ultimate, and that means that even if, you know, normally when Trevor was caught out in the last game, he could just pop his ultimate as long as it wasn't a Moomoo stunning him. And in this one, he gets silenced immediately, knocked up immediately. There's no way to actually pop that ultimate effectively at the right time to really abuse it before the other team gets a chance to kind of counteract what had happened. But mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because the fight afterwards just went so disastrously. The rest of CLG was able to flood in and kind of pick up the pieces of that fight before the randoms were able to get out of it so they are fighting back much more effectively the rift herald uh, i think that's the second one that uh, hasn't been, or got popped really early to try to pull some attention away mm -hmm. from the dragon from the randoms but it's not going to actually work i don't even know if they're actually going to be able to push down mid tower oh, oh. <gasps> Ooh, it almost was a steal there. CLG Faith still trying to fight with arrow? this one. The Enchanted Crystal Arrow is going to land onto Psycho. Followed up with the charm. Followed up the damage from Draco. And that equals another kill for this Gwen. Out comes that Cannon Barrage. It's going to be too little too late. The rest of AoE randoms have to run away. But they did get Dragon number three. 
and they full committed right here actually to the retreat instead of coming pop being able to pop back to the mid tower so the defensive mid tower was completely negligible now it's just geiger and pockets so they're going to try to prevent the uh, rift herald from charging a second time but they might actually pull two towers which means i think mm -hmm. grand scheme of things clg are perfectly fine they just pull the 2000 gold advantage off the back of third dragon of the game not the biggest deal in the entire world when there's plenty more to go you still have 10 minutes before you can get to a soul point they've got wiggle room they just pull their first gold advantage especially with draco being as strong as he is right now feels like he might be able to just like full carry team fights in the right circumstance i mm -hmm. think they're willing to bet on that yeah that's no matter what position it looks like no matter how far ahead it looks like aoe randoms is clg draco he's not going to be initiating on these fights unless he knows <laughs> the rest of the team is in a solid position to continue on and there it is the hostile takeover is going to land onto two very members nice, why nice. not kill your own team cold throw here we'll see if they can continue the fight no but the minions are in the wings so this should be yet another tower to go down in favor of clg Ooh, maybe not Yep, Psycho was able to be here for the defense of the team, and he is strong enough that it doesn't. Uh, yeah, he was able to shove the rest of them out, which is a nice uh, little addition to everything else that had occurred right there. So they just get the kill, and they don't break anything else. Uh, the range of the Gwen, despite all the mobility that Draco is bringing to the table, is something to concern yourself with, especially because again, you got some kite back potential, you got a zero wall, you got ways to try to counteract members running into your team the way that you know uh, Draco is going to have to in the, like the long term, especially if the needlework isn't used uh, to really push down an is his health eventually mm -hmm. the randoms have the range to work with to actually i think really deal with some of the members that are going to be getting up close right there was a good indication of draco and rose thorn being most of your damage at this point in the game but eventually geiger is going to be terrifying enough that that's going to be a ris risky prospect so clg mm -hmm. do have to convert this advantage into something before the game goes too long otherwise like you said i think the scaling starts to catch up to them yes absolutely it starts ahead in favor of aoe randoms but yeah, I still have that three item spike, right? That Draco is looking for and has just been able to lock in the Nasher's tooth, right? You just throw mm -hmm. down, uh, you throw down the stopwatch, you throw down the Zonias on top of it, and you've got the trifecta for this Gwen. And again, it's really the sustainability, right? Where it looks like it's a good fight that AoE randoms are going in on, but they have to be so careful because if they don't know where a single member of CLG is, I can guarantee you they're close enough to Draco to guarantee that he stays alive himself here. Uh, and th there's really good Enchanted Crystal Arrows as well coming through out of Eren. I like uh, Geiger's ultimates, these, these global ultimates that are basically kind of being used countered. But the unfortunate side for AoE randoms is where they were hoping to have a lot of that early damage in this gangplank, you know, in getting this Callista boosted up pretty early on. It means they just have to stall things out. And if something oh. like this happens, it's not going to work well for them. No escapability. Cold throw ends up going down, caught out in his own jungle. And in the meantime, Draco's going to find another tower towards the bottom side, leading to four in favor of fate. And they pop the Ash Arrow. I was worried they were going to have to burn the Cyclone as well, but they actually don't because of perfect play from Trevor being able to like layer on the Handshake afterwards really effectively. Mm -hmm. They knew they had push on bottom side. They had enough push in mid lane because the towers are both down. And so it's far enough in that like Cole throw is a little shallow in his jungle, but even being as far back as he was, he gets punished by that perfect Ash ultimate. You had just been praising Aaron for that as Draco. Oh. I, I, I mean... That's just gracious. not okay. No. Uh, to, uh, you know, oh man, it's it, it's been a lot of a lot of bullying again mm -hmm. on on to Geiger, and I can't say you know it has it's been all the presence of Rosethorn, right? Who did yeah. take a little while to actually make an appearance in these lanes, but really hasn't been camping the top side or anything like that. It was Draco with the early pressure. It was Draco with the early roam who was able to get himself these items ahead of his opposition, and then everybody's just kind of catching out Geiger, which really does set AOE randoms back pretty far behind, especially considering this is Zier that was a really solid pickup mm -hmm. and was their first choice here. Going Going into the game still has not gotten an assist let alone any single son or any kind of kill or elimination at all once again it's a game where it feels like nemesis just hasn't really interacted with the map they haven't found their big team fight where i think the azir is going to make the most impact of everybody yep. and like you were saying i don't necessarily know that it was draco that like or that Rose Thorn or anybody else really made the impactful kind of statement for Draco in the first place. But eventually mm -hmm. this team has really leaned into that side of the map specifically to start making plays because they understand how powerful the Gwen truly is. Yeah. The random set up their, their plate in the mid lane, that's the Azir Tower, to be able to try to prevent the enemy team from pushing in, to be able to hold control of the mid lane just a little bit better so they can hold the river. Nice pull! There it is. It's a big one. Can they follow it up with enough damage? They actually engage onto the backside. Once again, the hostile takeover is still actually available. There it goes out on the two members. Draco gonna find one. Thorn so low has the ignite on him. Will end up going down. And that's pick up right there for Nemesis and Pacus. A lot expended, but that means that AoE randoms at least take dragon number three. 
And that's their win condition, I think, at this point in the game. They're down about 2,500 gold still. AOE, or my apologies, CLG was able to find enough of, of like a play to make this at least salvageable to some extent, right? But ultimately, they weren't able to make things happen. I think it's partly because Nemesis was able to live that fight. The Zonius was perfectly used. The ult was perfectly used. You'll have to watch it. Uh, not to mention, again, Pocket's making this Blitzcrank just such a disgustingly good pick. He picks Rose Thorn <laughs> at the beginning of this fight, forces him into a rough position. He and Draco go deep into like the back line before turning towards the damage dealer of Nemesis. And that's what lets Nemesis press that ultimate disengage the rest of these members. Mm -hmm. And look at that, Rose Thorn's health bar, Trevor's health bar, whoa, way too low to continue on right there and not enough space for Ash to work with to step back in. So it's perfect uh, usage of that ultimate. Again, we, we've been wanting Nemesis to step into this game at some point because <laughs> it didn't happen in the last one. That's the first big impact he's held inside of these games. Yeah, and Geiger's ultimate still at least coming into play, right? You apply the slow, you still apply the damage, and it did quite a bit to some of these carries on the side of CLG Faith. So combining those two really well with each other, it stalled out Trevor's ability to use the hostile takeover earlier. Like he wanted to, he had to reposition and was only able to layer it onto two members there. So AoE randoms are doing a really good job of adapting well to this gameplay, but they need to try to find some of their own pickouts instead of these just, just these reactive plays, right? Granted, again, like I said, the longer this game goes, the better things are looking for them. But if they end up giving away objectives and map control, which is what CLG Faith is really good about taking control of, then that timeline doesn't really matter as much. Not the slightest. We're, we're in another position where, at, at minimum, CLG held to control the game. They're up uh, you know, a fair amount of gold, but at least AOE Randoms has something to kind of uh, you know, turn the fate of the game with, right? In the last game, they didn't have dragon control. They didn't have gold lead. They didn't have a composition that fit particularly well when it came to being down inside of a game. Now they can kite backwards inside of fights. They've got enough gold in the right places to make things at least manageable, right? They're starting to get gold in the members that can put in damage as they're kiting backwards. You can see Geiger's on two items, you know, and Nemesis on two and a half, three items, getting there at least a little bit. Um, and so CLG, once again, it feels like the onus is on them to make the forcing play that wins them this game right now because they're... They, they can't sit on a 2,000, 2,500 gold lead and expect to win against AoE randoms if they get nothing else done inside of this game. So I like that they're forcing Baron. They're going to try to draw AoE randoms into a you know, kind of a clustered team fight where Draco is going to get a lot more uh, kind of uh, value for what the ultimate is going to be. Uh, as well as right now, I think Geiger's on the other side of the map. Ultimate is down. It got thrown <gasps> into the pit. The hook nearly hits and we've definitely done something right there. But TP still available for Geiger. Not here yet. Decided just to bump the ultimate and do nothing else. Going to shove the side lane and now start to walk up to mid lane. And there's so much mobility, so many dashes available and opportunities to escape away from that that pocket's hook that all they need is a little bit of vision. Like CLG Faith just supplied there on that side and AOE randoms, a lot of you know their opportunities go out the window. And, you know, I, I goes back to what I was just saying, finding some of these, uh, you know, proactive opportunities for themselves instead of just using reactive uh, responses to some of these plays to try to pick or clean things up from CLG Faith. And this is maybe an opportunity here for AoE Randas, maybe a collapse to come through. Town is all alone towards the top side, but nobody wanting to actually make a play on that aside from just responding to the pressure in the lane. Yeah, it, right there, they actually split up quite a bit because I like that Town pushed in top lane. That requires, requires somebody to walk up there. They've got great setup around the Baron buff right now. Um, a minute 30 till Dragon, and they're starting to shift back into bottom side. So they've got enough vision defensively around this Baron on the side of CLG that the randoms aren't able to just like take this in response without doing some kind of diligence or without the side of CLG knowing. And now they move into bottom side where they can start to you know, capture position so they don't need to waste their warding. They can keep it around the Baron, use some more shallow wards, that type of area to make sure they have control and knowing when the entrance is going to come through from the randoms. And then they're going to step into River and potentially just grab up the Dragon so that the randoms can't get the Infernal Soul, which would be a massive game breaker in the favor of the randoms but would almost certainly win them this game mm -hmm. that would be huge pick, 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 pick. there it is what? no way it's the charm out nemesis does so much damage town actually barely able to get out of that one so a nice little sneaky play right there I'm a little more upset with how little damage that Town did, because Town got a full combo and oh, yeah. never frost <laughs> off and did like maybe 40% of the health bar. And that's the benefit of the Merc Treads, the Leandries, all this extra uh -huh. stuff coming through for Nemesis. It's too tanky to actually make it work. It's TPs. That's a deep TP coming through from... Oh, Draco's behind everyone! Draco, there it is. The Enchanted Crystal Arrow is going to hit the back. Oh, 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 oh. Multiple people get popped up. It's multiple flashes out. Pock is going to be thrown with Psycho's ultimate, but it's not enough on the backside. Nemesis has to use that. Zonies, but will be picked up. The ultimate comes out on top of it, but it's a big shutdown going over to that TP or Draco. Pockus maybe still looking for something, has the chance to get 
a pull, and there's the pull, but it's too little too late. It's after Town comes in and throws out the charm. That means that Psycho will be the next target. Draco finds yet another kill. Let's make that guy godlike, and only one remaining member of AoE randoms means that CLG Face should be able to very quickly secure themselves the Baron. And that was one of the, the quickest calls I think I've ever seen from the side of CLG Faith. One of the meanest calls, too. As soon as they see that there's an opportunity to get a flank angle from Draco, they get a fantastic ward behind the team. It opens them up for a fight win. They get Dragon, so they're able to shut out the win condition of the Infernal Soul for at least another five minutes. They drive up the Baron. They grab up a 5,500 gold lead. And this is what's going to break the game. I said it. CLG needed to find something to get themselves the win in the game. They were the ones with the onus. This was the play right here off the back of Rose Thorn getting this amazing engagement with Draco's flank on the side. Keep your eye. That's Draco's entrance. And now watch Rose Thorn because he's going to throw his W alongside the Ash Arrow, get right in the middle of the team. And that's all mm -hmm. that is necessary. That right there immediately won them the fight. Everyone's too low on the other side. Nevis tries to carry. I think an ultimate a little earlier maybe could have pushed two of them back into Focus, mm -hmm. back into Psycho. Maybe they can get some return kills instead of pushing them the opposite direction. But right. that was a panic ultimate, I think, at the least to say. And these pickoffs were more influential than I think that was possible. If they keep everybody alive on the side of randoms, they probably can't Baron because of the health bar situation on CLG. Yep. But because they bring down everybody except Colthrow, there is nobody left at the defensive Baron. Instead, they walk away with every objective on that. Okay, now I gotta ask, though, because I know second, third, and fourth dragons were picked up by AoE randoms. Uh -huh. What secured that dragon? Because I saw Colthrow go down to pick that one up. Rose How... Thorn. Was it Rose Thorn that went down Rose... as well? Okay. Rose Thorn was down at the dragon, taking it in, right. in the midst of everything. All I think right. Colthrow maybe turned cool. around to see if anyone was there, but unfortunately, Rose Thorn had already yeah. taken it, so... Uh, he navigated his way down there just too little too late. <laughs> Basically saw yeah. CLG Faith navigating their way up to the Baron and said, okay, maybe I can take that, but had to navigate through his own uh, his own jungle. That makes sense. My eyes are stuck on the Baron is the problem there, Rebel Fox, is that when Fair I enough. see a Baron being taken, I cannot look away because I'm looking for the steal on that side of things. Pacus tries to throw a hook over, maybe looking for a single pick out here, but with Rose Thorn and Aaron together, they can't really cross over this wall. They have to defend their <laughs> turrets because it is a double break that CLG Faith is working on. They're at least pushed back a little bit, but that does mean that Faith is going to be able to clear out the enemy jungle. Give a little shout out to our production team because I just saw that message, Hyper throwing the messages in, and of course our observer, Ibram, who's uh, smurfing as usual, even though he causes all of our problems on the production side, he is a wonderful man and he, he does some incredible work. So just props oh. to them as we get this incredible wide shot view watching as we, we get like a split push between Draco, who needs to be mm -hmm. in the middle of the four men so that they can team fight and town on the other side as the most mobile member just making sure the ash ult gets thrown pushes them back far enough that the mid inhibitor goes down just has to be accepted by aoe randoms as again i feel like they're just buying time for an extra dragon they desperately want to grab the infernal drake because that's what gets them back into the game if they aren't able to grab that before the game ends or if they aren't able to compete for that then the game is basically over they're going to be hoping that they can flip a fight somehow but that's not a very high bet right now it's not, and it's really looking scary because there is just so much damage coming out of CLG Faith. They're continuing to break through. They've got another 16 seconds left on these buffs. Pac is barely missing out on some of these pulls just because of the additional range that CLG Faith has within themselves to be able to poke back the members of AoE randoms. That should be yet another inhibitor. That's yet another lane that's going to have super minions. Maybe a play oh. being made here, but it ends up being Town. Throws out the charm. Cold Throw now has to run away from the needlework. It's his ultimate that gets him out alive, and Pac is barely getting out with just a sliver of health so no members of aoe randoms actually fall in that but clg faith makes a massive break into the base of aoer that they do they've got the top inhibitor they've got the mid inhibitor when it comes to setting up the dragon they've got the perfect setup on the map to make sure that's going to be the case as well as the two lanes that are going to be setting up around the baron aaron might die oh. here aaron oh, oh no that was very close and definitely kyger coming in that's to provide a little bit of additional damage Okay, how long is the death timer? Because it's 43 seconds. You have maybe a 30 second period, 20 second period where like Aaron is going to be up and he's going to have to basically beeline it immediately to the dragon pit mm -hmm. because otherwise there's no contest. And that's, again, the one win condition that the AoE randoms have at the moment. That was strange. I guess Nemesis just trying to make sure that the wave on top side, I was hoping he would use it in mid lane, but I guess there's going to be so many members in mid lane. They just go, okay, we throw the plate in top. It's going to prevent the wave from coming in. They can't win. They can't split on that side now. Or at least it's going to be a lot harder to do so. That means that we get priority over the Dragon Pit. They're setting up for it very heavily. This is the AoE random shot. This is what keeps them in the game. This is what keeps them in the series and keeps their Proving Grounds hopes alive is this one Infernal Dragon that they've got so much set up for. 
See the teleport coming through from town. Draco still has his up and available. There is the spawn coming out of Aaron. So the hawk shot is thrown through. There's still 20 seconds before this dragon spawns. Plenty of time for Draco to decide to navigate his way back down or just request a ward to be placed so that he has the ability to teleport later on. And he does end up just staying in that bottom lane, actually. No need to recall quite yet. 7, 1, and 3, and has the opportunity now to pinch in on this AoE randoms team. There oh. is the Enchanted Crystal Arrow. Out goes Rose Thor and the Cyclone to follow it up. It's a big charm as well. Onto Pox, onto the backside. Nemesis on the front line of this fight, having to use that stasis. Ends up falling down the flag. Wow. Order response from Draco Town, finding it another one, and that means the Town's able to circle around and ensure the pinch comes through. An ace by Aaron, the teleport, while the the end of the game is the goal here for CLG Faith. 32, almost 33 minutes is what it has taken to end this in a 2-0 sweep. And unfortunately for everyone hoping for a game number three, CLG Faith is just looking way too good today to allow that to happen. They're going to take down AoE randoms quite decisively, Rebel Kept it, kept it insanely clean. That was my favorite part about it from the side of CLG, right? They weren't taking these massive swings. They weren't making way too over-aggressive over moves. There was nothing like specifically intensively mechanical about anything in their win is made really decisive calls consistently they made sure to play around their options and the windows that aoe randoms were giving them and they tested aoe randoms and said okay if you want to come back you have to be able to force a play you have to find something against us and it just didn't happen they didn't give them any you know breathing room whatsoever to work with and that dragon was the one thing and clg knew how to play around it very effectively yep. uh, and off the back of a monster performance from draco again somebody that i don't think we've, we've hero built nearly enough over the course of the split because he is an absolute uh, terror uh i think he's an exciting player to watch as, as he's developed on clg mm -hmm. as they also i'm pretty sure that also claims on the top 10 spot inside of proving grounds which is exciting as well because again this was a team that was on the brink of losing out there like mm -hmm. multiple times they almost didn't make it into the first tournament yep. through the open qualifier they lost two times on the first day came back then they made it into top 12 thankfully off the back of that and then they did it again this time where again they were on the brink of infinity potentially not making it to proving grounds their first split just came confirmed it for themselves incredibly well done from clg Faith. oh yeah the entire top side of their map is incredibly strong like right now and their capabilities of picking incredibly mobile champions really really early initiators um, and very cohesive compositions is really working wonders for this team and i love to see them do this well because it really was this time you know obviously we always talk about rose thorn who's an incredible player but my gosh was it a draco game and if i happen to see draco able to snag a gwen i don't care what your counter pick is clearly it does not matter at this point no matter how much pressure you try to put up in that lane no matter how much counter ability you might think you have in your composition it's not gonna happen he's too darn strong on this one and it's something that people need to watch out for from this player in general but very very well played here by clg faith the pretty uh fitting name for the team themselves aoe randoms struggled once again and uh did not come out of this one on top but hopefully had the opportunity to learn quite a bit and Gygar, I, I just feel so bad about, about how much pressure was held in that top lane, really not allowing him to participate the way that he wanted to. But we got our games. We do have an interview coming up. And you know what? I could say who it's with. Like, yeah, I could say we got an interview coming up with Cold Throw. So all you Cold Throw fans, don't go anywhere. We're going to toss it to a very quick break. But when we come back, of course, Ravishing Ravish, the most ravishing man on the internet is going to be breaking down some of those plays from games numbers one and two in series two. Thank you so much. We'll be right back with more Proving Grounds. I start things off, of course, we do have this man with the piercing eyes that I've ever seen. Mr. Coulter, how we doing, baby? Good. Pretty good. That's well, despite I the loss, but... I mean, hey, which, by the way, uh, respect to y'all on that, you know, of course, consider. Losses are, of course, tough, too, but, you know, your hair still looks great, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, but let's go ahead and break that down right from the beginning, right? So just talking a bit about the game in general, too. Did you have any thoughts on playing against your old teammate, Aaron, as well? Um... He's pretty good, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. I always, I always cheer on Aaron through every match he played, especially last OQ when I was just a just a spectator. Um, I, I was looking forward to playing him today. Unfortunately, I couldn't match him with like a competitive series, but I'm glad that he gets to move on and play Turmeric again. Mm -hmm. I, I am as well. You know, I, it's, it's also nice to see, just just to see that you know, even though y'all used to be homies, but maybe you not so much anymore playing on the same team. I appreciate you looking out for yours as well. That's what's up. Though. But one big thing I do want to focus on, considering you know, you've been playing for a hot minute, right? And you've taken on a lot of different multiple roles. I want you to describe to me in an overall macro perspective your growth from last year. You're looking at yourself on GVU as well, and where you are today right now. 
Um, I think I used to be a very selfish player um, when I was playing before. Um, I got taught how to play more selfishly in other ways as well by playing with people like Rovex, who's very smart about the game, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. And then going back to GVU, it felt pretty complete having to try and show others how to play the game too, because they're all, I was playing with rookies um, my last semester as well. Um, and then it's kind of fun going into this roster as well, because these guys are all um, some of the some of the veterans, some of them are a bit new, but we're all relatively older people, older guys. Besides Psycho, I think he's a bit younger, but mm -hmm. um, we all like to have fun, so it's chill. I mean, you know, as long as it's chill, and I'm I'm glad to hear that you've grown so far, because that's how you were able to show that you know, no matter what, as things progress, that so do you, as you adapt and evolve as a player, which is all we can ask of uh, on many of our players and teams, right? But looking at you know where things are right now of course tg nearly always coming to an end as well so i did want to get your plans for the future you know what lies ahead for you colter um i plan to graduate in fall at nice. grandview um i plan to be a i'm, I'm still gonna be you know a big spectator for league i love um especially the amateur scene and collegiate scene um mm -hmm. I would love to move to a more management role. I had a lot of fun doing DK crew stuff um, last OQ. Hell it was yeah! Insanely fun. It felt it's it's really nice having no pressure um, as a player. Obviously, it, it's a bit fun, you know, with these types of games, mm -hmm. having fun and having that a little bit of that pressure. But I really enjoy management type roles or coaching stuff like that. So I look to move into that um, sometime in six months, a year, something like that. All right. Well, yo, y'all heard it here first. My man wants a management role. Let's see if we can go ahead and get him. All right, and of course, although it was an unfortunate loss today too, but I know that there are a lot of people out there cheering for you as well. So for all your adoring fans, what do you want to say to them? Um, I love Chookies and Azog. They're my best friends. They always support me. I always support them. It's been like three years with them. I've been um, rooting them on. I saw Azog smash today, the MU, MU set. Um, I hope Chookies gets second in his group next week. So yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, respect. Appreciate you coming on. Talk to me here, homie. You know, although... We made up the result that you want today, but I was still very happy with how, with how y'all played. And I think y'all should have held your head up high. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Take care. All right, welcome on back. We do got the winner's interview with my main man, Aaron, bro. How are you yes, looking, sir. man? We're doing good, doing good. I'm feeling really relieved that we were able to 2-0 well here, but yeah. All right, that's what we led to here. I know, I know, I must be on a cold. I was talking about before about <laughs> just, the, just, just, just how much of a pressure and just kind of things yeah. on the chest as you're playing, like playing, uh, playing again, bro. I can't even imagine the amount of pressure y'all go through day to day, man. Yeah, for sure. And playing against Colter, I mean, that was my ex CLO teammate, so it was beef for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, we, I had to win, or it's going crazy in the group chat right now. But I'm gonna talk more. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, you knew whoever go win, bro. It's about to be some heat draft for on sure, either one sure. of y'all, which is that's what's up. <laughs> but let's go ahead and scale it back a little bit as well. Let's talk a bit more about you so far, right? Because uh, you know, coming into today too, I know people were really back and forth in your team, right? Now, would yeah. you say that at this point, of course, the criticisms are, are they fair, or is it something that that they're not seeing? I mean, it's fair. I mean, it's most of us are new players, are like pretty relatively new. Me. I mean, I only played like one real split of amateur, not even, mm -hmm. but me, Town, and Draco. I mean, we're all pretty new, so it's going to be some growing pains. I mean, I just want to thank um, Rose, who's came back like a few weeks yeah. ago. Him and Trevor have been teaching me a lot, and I'll be asking them a lot of questions. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, like, I know we're like all new players, or most of us are new players. So, I mean, of course, it's going to be a little hard in the start, but I mean, I think sure. we're getting a lot better for sure. Yeah. And I could agree more, too, but you always ask the fantastic point. Like you mentioned, man. Rose back as well to uh, helping uh -huh. y'all out, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. of course, Rose, I imagine, is a big voice for the team. He's very experienced too. But y'all have, have only had him back for two series, right? How yeah. did you get him in so quickly and like work with him so fast? I mean, he's just like, he he's able to teach us a lot quickly. Like he's been mm -hmm. in an academy. He's been a top jungler in academy. So, yeah. I mean, just having him in and even for a few scrims, we were able to learn a lot and he's able to just like, just tell us shit. Oh, sorry, sorry. Tell us like yeah. info and like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is honestly that's what's up, right? Because considering just getting the chance to be able to absorb as much information as possible too. Yeah. Because <clears throat> looking at you right now, you know, how far would you say that you've come from who you were even from the beginning of the year as a player? I mean, I've gotten a lot better. I, I say sp especially in laning, um, laning with Trevor. I mean, like this guy likes to fight, and like I, I like to learn from that. So fighting every mm -hmm. time in scrims, it can get a little 
being a little troll, but I mean, I'm definitely improved from it for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean also even today too, I was low key like <laughs> uh, sitting on my chair, like, yo, yeah. is this? Are they about to get level three right now? That's what's uh, happening. Oh, but <laughs> yeah. I was close, man. Y'all making me sweat. Y'all making me sweat. It's all good, though. It's all good. Yeah. But look at the future right now of CLG, and perhaps you as a player as well. What do you want to be known about the air? Like, what are people not saying about you? What should be said? I think, I mean, even though I'm a young, I haven't been playing the best of split, I'll keep it real, but I mean, I'm going to mm -hmm. keep on improving, and I'm just going to show that I can't compete with the best, even though some don't think so. Yeah. All right. All right. That's what we'd like to hear. And of course, uh, Final classic question too for all the homies out there watching you, even in the group chat. What you want to say to them? Um, <laughs> nothing much. I mean, Kothro's free, and uh, shout out to my teammates, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's a shot through the heart. <laughs> yeah, man, I love him. I love him. I love him. I know you do, man. But I appreciate you talking <laughs> to me today, homie. Good stuff today from y'all, and I am hyped to see what Steel G brings forth more. Take care. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. That was that was a very, very fun time. You know, it was a lot back and forth. I love how Coltro was like humble and like he's a man. I want to support my friends. And then Aaron's like, yo, Coltro was free. GG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you win, you get to see what you want, right? <laughs> Bro, you are not wrong at all. So let's talk about that win and break down that final series of the night column let's just just give it to you what's up give me this <laughs> okay all right well oh no column has gone well goodbye column that was fun it was nice hearing you while i could but that's okay cool uh while column gets that figured out rmc uh you know what? let's try to pretend we know what column is saying and then let's say it for him Oh man, but with Calmer, it's got to be dropped, right? Uh, he did, didn't like the yeah. drop, thought that. Uh, <laughs> see, you know, AOE randoms didn't execute well. Uh, I'm honestly not sure where he <laughs> wanted to go with that, so I'm going to go with where I wanted to go with this year, and mm -hmm. Calmer can join back in. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. it's uh, I believe I believe hey, Calmer was here, which he's definitely not. So. <laughs> Uh, I believe Calmer would have wanted to say, man, I sure do like being six feet and dead lifting my sadness away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Calmer, am I right? I think it's working. I think you're there. Oh, you're kind of there. Ah, we there. got you. Yeah. Yeah. He's back. He's back. yeah. I was actually talking to Draco. Your guesses were wrong. But, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was basically saying that the series, uh, this game specifically was very stagnant, but uh, I was really impressed with Draco with games and series on the Gwen. Um, going into it, I talked about how uh, personally I wanted to see more from him specifically. Uh, given the situation he found himself in especially having solo earlier this year and i was expecting to see a bit more growth uh and this series really showed that like he's he's out of the series very big in the situation where clg needed it uh this series doesn't technically lock them for top 10 it practically does barring some really really weird upsets happening like five different series uh so congrats to clg um and congrats to draco man uh great series for them and he really carried his team and uh was by far the mvp of the series yeah, I think coming into the series, we were kind of saying that for the CLG faithful right here, they need to be praying. Had they prayed and Draco answered, because Draco was, it was a Draco dip this game, this entire series here. The fact that he's blind picking this Gwen as well multiple times into these matchups and coming out massively ahead. Game one, you can say, okay, you know, it was Aaron winning out that bot side uh, early here but with Trevor, but this game, it wasn't. He just absolutely dominated. And this replay as well, the, the fact that Draco gets this flank, you know, Rebel at Citadel and Cast, a split second decision, really quick play. And generally, Gwen flanks aren't the scariest thing, but this flank found all the carries, Pop, Nem, which was the, the most important person there the moment Nem9 goes down. It's a fight one. It's all the objectives for Siyoshi. It could be tougher and tougher as it uh, as it goes in, right? Although with the, with the, with this massive deflect, which ended up working out, so you've seen how Nem Nine, his ultimates either were a little bit early, a little bit later, truly could have made all the difference in that fight as well. Was just showing how impactful player he is, right? That is, on its own is quite impressive, but him not being able to get the space, you know, although it became a detriment, but uh, past that as well, CLG continued to rise above the standards. You know, of course, the bot lane too, they did quite well here. And across the board, I said, they're not afraid to go in. But for the first 20 minutes, nothing really happened. Aside from that, though, it seemed to be them firing on all cylinders. And CLG right now, I have to call him, 
our Sierra look pretty good. They look a lot more decisive in what they're doing. And I think Rosie coming back is a big part of that. I think Aaron spoke to it a little bit about how meaningful it is to have a player with that much veterancy, that much experience, that much of a voice coming into your team, you know, with the experience that he does bring. I think that they look like a completely different team with him in. No, obviously no flame to Vega, who did great filling in, but uh, Rose Thorne as a player who, again, like we said earlier, was just absolutely doing so, so well in Academy to come back down an amateur, uh, not necessarily saving the team, but in a way kind of saving this team who kind of looked lost in, you know, uh, my wayward son just kind of running around, not really knowing what they're doing. And to come in and really show some direction, have like a voice for this team to be very decisive, it shows a lot in their gameplay. This does not look like the same team that we saw in the first tournament. And it, even in the OQs, um, like the team looks so much better. And I think Rose Thorn has a big part of that. Yeah, or even last week when Rose Thorn first stepped in as well, right? We didn't see this level of coordination. And it felt a lot like for CLG, they were a team where you could kind of just play them late and they would eventually make a mistake somewhere where you could try yeah. and make a comeback. This series wasn't the case whatsoever here. Uh, you know, Rose Thorn definitely coming in being that veteran voice, making sure that they don't have those cracks in the mid to late game. And now teams will have to view CLG Faith very, very differently in how they prepare and move forward into them. Indeed they will, right? And just seeing how we got two woes across the board today, although some surprising, some not. Um, Yet again, I just want to point out that I was uh, right both times today. Same. So just, let's go, let's take that in. RMC? I, uh, oh, RMC was wrong both times today. That's which I'm not shocked by. Clearly, we know who superior analysts are currently. So let's take a quick look. Of course, our cast prediction as well. You know, as to what they had to show for themselves. Because, uh, you know, some of them, I'm sure, were really confident with what they decided to pick. Some of them were not. I know one person specifically that being beat down uh, went one <laughs> for four today. Uh, but it's fine. He also owned four, but good on him for picking the correct team, right? Shout out to them. And. I do also want to give one of the shout outs to, of course, uh, our fantastic guest, uh, Mr. Colmer, who come in and sitting down with us yet again, back to back. Appreciate your wonderful insight, your beautiful face, and for helping make my day brighter. It's always fun Anytime, to have you man. here. Thank you for allowing me to harass you on broadcast. I appreciate it. Yay. And <laughs> of course. What <laughs> happened? Does, does nobody remember the opening we had today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. This doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's okay. Forget about all that. RMC, of course, dude, you're great. You're you're wonderful, right? You're very big brain. Things are all great there. And of course, thank you for sponsors who helped make all of this happen, making sure that everything's everything's all good, fine, and dandy. Appreciate y'all. Of course, everybody on the back end too. Check them out. All our prod crew, uh, OBS, of course, too. Make us look good. Our casters, Jolly and Rebel Fox. And thank you for watching. All this happens because of viewers like you. I've been Ravish. Such a sense. Ravish the internet. We'll catch y'all next time. Bye bye.